This is 1968, The Game Changer. In a ring, on a court, on a track, on a diamond, and on a rink, again and again, champions have been made. But while so many simply come and go, in 1968, the champions crowned across these fields of play wouldn't go, nor quietly fade away. Because what each of them did during that year, so frenzied with the winds of change, was redraw the lines that had long defined their sports. Throughout this hour, we'll look back at not only the games they changed, but also the culture and the conventions that's forever made them much more than mere athletes. And we begin with the saga of Muhammad Ali, the champ arguably the most significant athlete of the 20th century. And while in 1968, he wouldn't step foot inside a boxing ring, it's what he did outside the ring that year and after that would turn him into a legend. Tell me how you came to get such a Roman name as that. Well, as I understand, I'm Cassius Marcellus Clay VI, and my great-great-grandfather was a Kentucky slave, and he was named after some great Kentuckian. Well, Cassius Marcellus Clay is a great name in Kentucky. And uh, really, where he was from, or where it was all originated, I couldn't tell you. But since I've reached a little fame in boxing, most people want to know where I'm from and uh, where did I get that name. But really, I haven't really checked on it, so I see that I'm going to have to go look into it. You'll have to look it up. If he was fuzzy about its lineage, Cassius Clay was certain of one thing. He loved his name, its lyrical beauty, so fluid and striking. It reminded the boy from Louisville of a Roman gladiator, which, in a 20th century sense, he was. As Cassius Clay, he won Olympic gold. As Cassius Clay, he pronounced himself the greatest. I tell the people that I'm the greatest. And as Cassius Clay, he shook up the world to become boxing's heavyweight champion in a stunning upset over the heavily favored Sonny Liston. Never, never make me no underdog and never talk about who's gonna stop me. Well, ain't nobody gonna stop me. Not a heavyweight in the world fast enough to stop me. But for all he earned as Cassius Clay, the name he so loved, the name now known around the world, for Clay, it began to lose its glow, though not because he was tired of hearing it, but because he was no longer content to be the person he'd become as Cassius Clay. He was no longer content to simply be a boxer. Young Cassius Clay was always outspoken. He always wanted to get as much attention as he could. And he avoided politics because he was focused on his boxing and on his career. But when he met Elijah Muhammad, when he learned about the Nation of Islam, and when he fell under the teachings of Malcolm X, he became politicized. Throughout the early 1960s, Clay's encounters with Elijah Muhammad, the Nation of Islam, and Malcolm X presented him with a new perspective one that, for Clay, was refreshingly different from the one he grew up with. He grew up hearing his father talk about the fact that black people were never going to be treated fairly in the Nation of Islam, talked about black people doing for themselves, creating their own businesses, creating their own society, and eventually having their own country. How could so few white people rule so many black people? They were a very militant group. Some would even say anti-white. These homegrown Negro American Muslims are the most powerful of the black supremacist groups. You talk about a lightning rod. That just uh, really ignited tremors uh, all over the country. And as such, Clay was initially cautious to commit to the Nation of Islam, though no less curious. He begins to explore this secretly for a while. That you know, that in 62, 63, he's going to meetings, he's hanging out with Malcolm X, he's learning about the religion. And by 1964, he's ready to embrace it with open arms. The day after reaching the pinnacle of his profession, knocking off Sonny Liston to win the heavyweight title, he throws caution to the wind, disavows his name, and in its place, takes up a new identity and along with it, a new sense of purpose. 
Cassius Clay is a name no more, is that right? Yes, sir. It's Muhammad Ali. And he says, I'm telling you guys this today. I am not Cassius Clay. That's a slave name. I said, you know, these are going to be some very interesting times. Cassius, you know my new name. Uh, Why are you calling me that? Will your next fight be billed as Cassius Clay or as Muhammad Ali? Muhammad Ali! On all the fights? Yes, sir! Ali was, was absolutely hated. Even Martin Luther King said he should stick to boxing and shut his mouth. He doesn't know what he's talking about because the Nation of Islam was seen as so radical. So he was really putting himself out there. And I think there's only one possible explanation for it. He truly believed. And after hearing the teachings of Ali, a man's mind is never the same again. But for Ali, if something stayed the same, it was his prowess as a boxer. What are you fighting again? Fight Who do you want me to fight? Who do the press want me to fight? Who do you think you should fight? With the best man. Throughout the middle 1960s, Ali defended his heavyweight title nine times. Be ready, because I'm coming to get you. He knocked you out by attrition. He wore you down, he wore you down. The jab took it out of you, took it out of you. But for his greatest fight, there'd be no boxing gloves, no punches thrown, save for the metaphorical ones. Instead, just a man steadfast in his convictions and a United States government intent on breaking them up. It was to be a showdown that, in a single, drawn-out affair, would bring to bear the issues of race, religion, and politics in America, and complete the conversion of Muhammad Ali, whose renown as a boxer would soon be rivaled by his renown as an activist. From the ring to a courtroom. Next, Muhammad Ali's stand against the Vietnam War, one that would alter not only the trajectory of his career, but also his legacy. Two fellas got together and made the statement that I'm 1A without knowing if I'm as good as I was the last time or better. In the winter of 1966, as the war in Vietnam was expanding, I have today ordered to Vietnam the Air Mobile Division. Muhammad Ali, who in 1964 failed his draft induction exam, was reclassified as 1A, draft eligible. Originally, when Ali realized that he was fake going to face the draft, he said, well, I just don't want to go. He even said that he didn't mind if his tax dollars were used to support the war. Why me, a man who pays the salary of at least 50,000 men in Vietnam, a man who the government takes $6 million from a year out in two fights, a man who can pay in two fights for three bomber planes. But soon, he took a much firmer stance refusing to fight for a country that continued to treat black Americans as second-class citizens. Taking it a step further, Ali declared himself a conscientious objector. And when the army finally did come calling in March of 1967, Ali refused induction. Former world heavyweight champion Cassius Clay refused to take the oath of induction into the army. The black Muslim fighter, who's also known as Muhammad Ali, was immediately stripped of his title by the World Boxing Association. Clay insisted that he is an ordained minister and should be exempt. It has been said that I have two alternatives. Either go to jail or go to the army. Not only did Ali grasp the consequences, I think he assumed that his career was over. Much as he'd been willing to sacrifice his beloved name, Cassius Clay, for the sake of his religious beliefs, he was willing to do the same in regards to his livelihood, though this time around, the consequences would be far more severe. He believed it was right. I know he was willing to go to jail. And I'm sure if there is some justice left here in the country, America, and if there is a little justice left, it will be prevailed in the courts. He lost, he was convicted of draft evasion, sentenced to five years in prison. And that wasn't all. He was fined $10,000, denied a boxing license in every state, and though free on bond, as a condition of his bail, his passport was revoked. Then, of course, there was the court of public opinion. 
At that time, everybody was against him, not only white America, but black America too. Khalila Ali would experience that scorn firsthand. Two months after he was convicted, she, then known as Belinda Boyd, married Ali, becoming his second wife. He was a struggling fighter with nowhere to go, nowhere to, no one to fight. This was the most depressing days of our lives. But he felt that he should make a stand and uh, just do what he do best. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us the religion of Islam, and I will die for it and give everything. While waiting to appeal his conviction, Ali had to come up with new ways to make money to support his new family. I said, you know what, you should go to some of the colleges and speak out for what you believe in and, stand, and speak out what you stand for. Always willing to speak his mind, Ali would do just that. And instead of fading away into obscurity as an exiled boxer, he became more relevant than ever before. I'd get a heavy penalty to the, the white preachers that break into government house, burn up the draft card, hang statues of the president, lay on the Pentagon step, leave America, white citizens. But I'm the bad one now, the full slave. Now I'm the bad one. That really galvanized the anti-war effort. We start to say, wow, he was right. You know, why should we fight for this country? We got nothing against the Viet Cong, too. It's not just black people got nothing against the Viet Cong. The whole country had nothing against the Viet Cong. So we start to come toward Ali in that respect. In the summer of 1970, with his case still working its way through the courts, there arrived a clear sign the tide against Ali was turning. We got a call from Atlanta, Georgia. And I answered the phone and he told me, he said, Ms. Ali, we got Muhammad's boxing license back. After three long years, with a license from the city of Atlanta, Muhammad Ali was finally allowed to re-enter a boxing ring. Have you any regrets about uh, what's happened over this last three years? What's the principal thing? No, I don't. I have no regrets. No, I'm angry at any of the boxing officials authorities who did what they thought was right when they took the title because of uh, my reasons on draft and religion, and I did what I thought was right. So. Uh, it looks like everything is clearing up, and that's all in the past, but I have no regrets at all. A few months later, Ali scored another victory, forcing the New York State Boxing Commission to reinstate his license, which ultimately landed Ali a chance to reclaim the title he'd been stripped of. Getting sick and tired of all this mess. Joe Frazier, the heavyweight champion of the world. Clumsy, ugly, flat-footed Joe Frazier. I'll show you what a real champion is. But while Frazier would get the better of Ali in the so-called fight of the century, months later, Ali would win true vindication when the Supreme Court reversed his conviction, citing insufficient evidence to dispute his conscientious objector claim. He could not believe it. He said, are you saying you playing with me? He thought I was joking. You playing with me? Are you really playing with me? And I said, honest Allah, I'm serious. <laughs> and that's when he knew I wasn't playing. And it was a beautiful feeling. And it was a, a day of freedom for us. And I'm thankful that the courts recognized my sincerity and my beliefs in this case. By taking the stance he did, uh, basically emboldened uh, African-American athletes uh, in every sport. The, the black athlete was expected to keep his mouth shut and perform for the white audiences before Ali. And Ali said, screw that. You know, God gave me a mouth and I'm going to use it. He gave me a fist and I'm going to use that too. And he, he rewrote the rules. He wasn't just a boxer. He was known for his, his belief. He was known for being steadfast in his fight for freedom, his fight to get back into the ring. And this is something that will be shared with our American people and the people all over the world for centuries and centuries to come. Next. Another young African-American journeys to the upper echelons of sport. When we come back, 
the story of the impeccable Arthur Ashe. Lieutenant Ash, you've reached the pinnacle in the all-white sport of American tennis. Did you find that being black was a handicap in getting there? Arthur Ashe helps the U.S. bring back the cup for the first time since 1963. I think in 68, Arthur knew some of the impact he was making on tennis and then on the world at that time. I don't think he knew that he was making as big an impact as he, as he did. My early tennis career was filled with discrimination. I would say that uh, that was the watchword of my uh, junior tennis life. From the start, the odds were stacked against him. Growing up in Richmond, Virginia, the home of the Confederacy, trying to compete in a sport long dominated by white athletes. Most of the tennis players and the game itself is built around member clubs, and uh, black people just are not members of country clubs and tennis clubs. But nevertheless, Ash forged ahead. Slender, quick with a powerful serve, he possessed undeniable skill, the kind that would land him a scholarship to play at UCLA. He was really making his way. In fact, at that time, a lot of the college players were some of the best players in the world. And among them, Ash set himself apart. If he was on, he'd beat anybody. Though, as he'd come to expect, what most set him apart continued to follow him wherever he went. The fact that my skin is brown, my hair is a certain way, what have you, uh, you can't get away from it. So uh, you have to accept it. I was with him many times when, uh, you know, he wasn't allowed to go in someplace. I remember at the River Oaks Tennis Club in Houston, he couldn't go into the men's locker room there. He had to go into the outside locker room. and. Uh, so it was a difficult time. Oh, yeah, there are some tournaments I can't play in Alabama or Louisiana. They're uh, invitational tournaments. They, they may invite whom they please. So, I, you know, I'm not a very militant person anyway, so if they don't want me, it's, it's okay with me. There it was more going on inside than he let, let the public see. But as his profile grew, what he'd been bottling up inside, he felt he could no longer suppress. There was too much at stake, not only for his sport, but more importantly, for his race. 1968 Davis Cup action. Arthur Ashe of the U.S. has match point against Australian Ray Ruffles. Months after winning his first Grand Slam title at the inaugural U.S. Open in 1968, Ash led the U.S. team to victory in the Davis Cup. It was an apt year to make his mark. While racial tensions bubbled across the country, Ash, in a space so often reserved for whites, reigned supreme. He was ranked the number one tennis player in the world, delivering him a platform that he would not let go to waste. There are other athletes and other black leaders, period, who, who are using their, their positions of, of power and influence to, to wield some practical progress. So I, it's just simply saying to myself, Arthur, uh, you must do something. You just cannot sit by and let the world go by. Arthur Ashe had a nobility to him. He was very involved in the black movement, the African-American movement in this country. He also got involved in the movement abroad, particularly in South Africa, where he became a prominent activist against the country's system of apartheid. Having grown up in the South, in the segregated South, I mean, I just wasn't going to stand for it. When it came to his own sport and its continued lack of diversity, he made his views plain. Is it the fault of anyone in tennis, the organization of tennis? Oh, it's directly their fault, yes. And when forced into a battle for his own life, Arthur Ashe would take up the cause with no shortage of courage. I have known since the time of my brain operation in September 1988 that I have AIDS. I was sitting in my office at home and I got the call from him and he said, I want you to know this, um, I got the HIV virus. He'd contracted it from a blood transfusion while receiving heart surgery. It hit me like a brick. He's a very bright guy. Uh, he has got a big heart. And, uh, it's tough. He fought until the very end. The way to contain this is just to get out there and try to educate as many people about the true facts as possible. 
and I am setting up a foundation of my own and we will be doing some things in cooperation with the sports world and uh, I would say 80% of what we're going to be doing is trying to educate people as to the truth about AIDS. On February 6, 1993, Arthur Ashe died at the age of 49. Arthur Ashe was just the same level of humility from the first point to the last. Arthur was always more than a tennis player. As great as he was as a tennis player, he was greater as a person. And no man is an island. You see, well, uh, things really aren't the way they should be, and, and uh, you're in a position now to change rather than just uh, bend with the wind. Still to come, remarkable moments of athletic genius from the mound of America's pastime. off the field statements made in 1968, there were just as many made on the field. Displays of athletic prowess so spectacular as to be deemed simply heroic. And we begin with the feats of two pitchers, Bob Gibson and Denny McLean, rulers of the mound who'd give rise to a season best remembered as the year of the pitcher. Lazard looks in to get his sign. Here's the windup, the pitch. There's a long drive to deep right. It's out of here. A home run by Norman Cash. It's the game's greatest thrill. That one majestic swing of the bat. There goes a long drive to left field. It's a home run. It's a feat that can turn men into giants. And one that, since the arrival of a slugger they called Babe, has been an integral piece of the national pastime. But for one remarkable year, a year in which the bats of baseball fell eerily silent, hushed by a dominance on the mound that has since been unsurpassed. It's the kind of year that uh, you just don't have, nobody has. But in 1968, Bob Gibson had that kind of year. A year after leading his St. Louis Cardinals past the Boston Red Sox in the 1967 World Series, Gibson would go on to post a minuscule 1.12 earned run average. It was this devastating slider that no one could really hit. Most of the guys were looking for fastballs, and I got most of them out with sliders. Sliders that the fearsome right-hander could place with pinpoint accuracy. I'll tell you what he could do in that 68 season. Uh, a baseball's about that wide, and Bob on the outside part of the plate could put the ball in an area of about two baseballs in width anytime he wanted to. And while Gibson frustrated hitters in the National League, in the American League, it was the Detroit Tigers' Denny McLean. I really feel that you've got to go out there knowing you can get every hitter out in every inning. McLean, often outspoken and with a fondness for the high life that would soon derail both his professional and personal life, in 1968 would dazzle for the Tigers all season long, putting up 31 wins. Everything seemed to be falling in place for, for him that year. Well, I played with, number one, I played with a great ball club. Um, I played with the right manager at the right time. But there was something else, too, that McLean benefited from during that 68 season, as did Gibson and every other pitcher in Major League Baseball. The powers that be had decided that offense had become so prevalent that things had to be scaled down. This came in the wake of the home run chase between Roger Maris and Mickey Mantle. Roger Maris, who comes through with his 61st homer for a new baseball record. So in an effort to even things up, Major League Baseball made a few changes. The two fundamental ones were raising the pitching mound from 10 to 15 inches and widening the strike zone uh, that allowed pitchers an obvious advantage against hitters. And no pitchers took greater advantage of those modifications than Bob Gibson and Denny McLean. On the backs of their commanding performances, both the Cardinals and the Tigers ran away with their respective pennants. 
setting up the kind of World Series matchup that was all too fitting for that year of the pitcher, Gibson versus McClain. So the 1968 World Series is underway here in St. Louis. 80 degree weather, sunny sky. For the duel about to unfold, there'd be no shortage of hype, something Gibson was inclined to ignore. The reporters come in and they, they had this thing built up in their mind, Gibson against McLean, and a uh, guy asked me, he says, uh, is it a big thing for you to pitch against McLean? I says, well, not if he's not a real good hitter. That's the only problem that I'm concerned about. <laughs> Setting aside any and all distractions, in game one, Gibson pitched like a man possessed. Here's the set by the right-hander, the pitch to K-line. Swing and a miss, and the is high. In the ninth inning, with his Cardinals leading four to nothing, Gibson threw his 15th strikeout, tying a World Series record set by Sandy Koufax. I'm reading this on the scoreboard, and I still have the ball in my hand. And Tim McCarver called timeout, and he ran out in front of the home plate. And I don't like to spend a lot of time messing around out there. And Bob came off the mound, and he said, give me the ball. I was yelling at him to get behind, uh, get behind home plate, and let's go. And he was pointing at the scoreboard. And he saw me motioning to the scoreboard, and he turned around and looked over his left shoulder. And it said that I had just broken Sandy Koufax. 15 strikeout record, I had tied it to something. I said, fine, that's good, let's go. When he walked back and ended up striking out the next two hitters. Bob Gibson gets strikeout number 17. That's the end of the ball game and the final score here in St. Louis, the Cardinals four, the Detroit Tigers nothing. But while Gibson was brilliant, McLean was anything but. McLean's arm was shot. Uh, not only had he pitched so much, but by then he is addicted to cortisone, which had you know, weakened his arm. And by mid-September, people could see uh, that he was really hurting. Lucky for the Tigers, pitcher Mickey Lolich would step up big. And after being down three games to one, the Tigers found a way to battle back against Gibson and the Cardinals to win the 1968 World Series. I mean, in some ways, it, it did live up to the hype being a great World Series, but just not the way that we expected. Certainly not the way Denny McLean expected, who, despite the Tigers' near-miraculous comeback, would later significantly downplay it. The World Series was kind of anticlimactic for us. There would never be another season quite like the one in 68, when the Major League batting average was a meager 237 and the average pitcher had an ERA under three. But as the era of TV revenue was emerging, that kind of dominance wasn't going to cut it. The following season, the mound was lowered and the strike zone was shortened. And in short order, offense would make a strident return to the game, leaving in its wake a last of its kind. It was the pinnacle of athletic symbolism around the globe, but the 1968 Summer Olympics in Mexico City would produce a moment that reshaped the sports world and continues to reverberate. Here they come now, here comes a tank. It's an armored assault carrier coming right toward us. It was a scene that, at the time, wasn't entirely out of step with the unrest breaking out in many other corners of the world. But even for 1968, the events that unfolded in Mexico City's Tlatelolco Plaza were exceptionally brutal. What began as a peaceful demonstration among students protesting an authoritarian regime ended in a massacre, and one, devastatingly enough, that would serve as a prelude to the Olympic Summer Games Mexico City was set to host 10 days later. A day of triumph. That's how Avery Brundage described it. At least it was in striking contrast to that day of bloodshed in the square of the three cultures. Certainly as the Olympic symbol rose ponderously from the stadium, there was hardly a hint of the unrest that had almost threatened to cancel the whole thing. But if the games and the spirit of the sport were enough to overshadow, if only for a fleeting moment, the unruly violence that transpired just days prior, 
they could do little to temper the turmoil that had been preordained to take center stage. As athletes from around the globe brought with them their own grievances, with every intention to air them out on the international platform that lay before them. And none would do it with greater effect than two sprinters from the United States named John Carlos and Tommy Smith. There are two heroes in this, and the two heroes are John Carlos and Tommy Smith. Courageous, committed, and absolutely unflappable in the face of tremendous pressure. The heroics Harry Edwards speaks of were something he set in motion when he established the Olympic Project for Human Rights and called on black athletes to boycott the 68 Summer Games to protest racism in the United States and abroad. Though fairly early on, it was clear Edwards wasn't going to win a total boycott. By the Negro athletes really going and showing what we're capable of doing in the Olympics, that would help the, uh, the Negro race much more than by just sitting at home watching the white athletes participate in the Olympics. I am standing up for what I feel right. I feel is right if I go to the games. And uh, uh, it's just a question of who's right. The decision concerning the Olympic Games and the participation of black people has been uh, that uh, we will not let you in on the decision. I never had any uh, notion that we would be able to forge a total uniform, unified boycott of the Olympic Games. I also understood that the powers that be in America at that time assumed that all blacks thought uniformly. But as long as that was out there, it cleared the path for us to look for alternatives in making that statement on an international political forum. They decided to use their platform, their international platform. The boycott was eventually called off and instead galvanized by a new wave of black pride and the emerging black power movement. Black athletes arrived in Mexico City not only prepared to compete, but also to deliver a message. We talked about a wide range of um, possibilities, but the two people who determine what they would do, who determine the method of protest, were John Carlos and Tommy Smith. On October 16, 1968, Smith and Carlos competed in the men's 200-meter race. Smith took gold with a world record time. Carlos finished third to claim the bronze. But what the world would remember was not what they did on the racetrack. It's what they did after, during the medal ceremony. I can remember I was sitting way up in the uh, uh, press area, but there was this huge gasp. Standing on the Olympics podium with shoes off, medals around their necks, Smith and Carlos turned to face the American flag and as the national anthem began to blare from the stadium speakers, they bowed their heads and raised a black glove fist. And you look down and you could just see those two black fists fist in there. It was a shock. And uh, I could remember running down there trying to fight through the crowd to get to the interview area and uh, they were already gone. Two days later, Carlos and Smith were told to pack their bags and go home. Smith and Carlos were told to leave the Olympic Village and Mexico within 48 hours. They were both stunned at the decision but retained their composure. For their Black Power salute, a gesture International Olympic Committee President Avery Brundage deemed inappropriately political, Smith and Carlos were expelled from the Games. How will this affect the rest of the black athletes on the United States Olympic team, other black athletes on Olympic teams around the world? Well, I don't think it's going to affect them in any way. I think it's going to affect the United States Olympic team now because I think they will have uh, demonstrations coming from all ends, not only from the United States, but all over the world. Of course, afterwards, everybody associated with the Olympic Project for Human Rights, especially uh, Smith and Carlos, were condemned, castigated, cut off from opportunities. By and large, when Carlos and Smith returned to the United States, they weren't received with a hero's welcome. 
they were vilified, save for those whose rights they were standing up for. There was a price to pay for having the audacity, the courage, the intellect and commitment uh, to challenge prevailing conventional thinking. And Carlos and Smith paid a heck of a price. But in America, this is a nation of second chances. They may not get it right the first time, but eventually they come around to seeing and understanding the validity of what happened. I was just trying to let them know that it was a problem, a lot of political play taking place within the Olympic Games, and if they didn't try and rectify things then, it would have gotten worse. It would take years for the country to come around, to finally trade its rebuke for admiration, to finally lend its understanding that what Carlos and Smith did was of far greater significance than any one athletic achievement. She became America's darling and revived a passion for a sport that had been decimated by tragedy. Still to come, Peggy Fleming and her quest for gold. Skating really encompassed all the things I loved. I loved athletics, I loved music, and I loved dance. So it was a combination, and um, I got a little carried away. <laughs> There's a new shooting star on the international skating scene, a 17-year-old miss from Colorado Springs, Peggy Gail Fleming. She possessed all the grace without any of the usual pedigree for a world-class figure skater. She was so unusual. Uh, her father had been a newspaper man. They were not wealthy. I was kind of a tomboy as a, a young girl. I loved sports. I loved to be outside. And I'm uh, number two of four girls. And I was the only woman that would play sports with my dad and go body surfing and play golf. And then I was introduced to figure skating when I was nine. When I stepped on the ice, I just went, wow, this is easy and it's quiet and it's smooth. And um, every time I went back to the skating rink, I got better. She was a natural and soon she began competing and winning. I won my very first championship. So I thought, wow, this is, this is my sport. With her parents' support, Peggy immersed herself in the sport. But just as she was doing so, U.S. figure skating was suddenly rocked by a catastrophe. I was 12 years old. I had no idea what an impact that tragedy would have on my career. On February 15, 1961, a Boeing 707 carrying the entire U.S. figure skating team to the World Figure Skating Championships in Prague, Czechoslovakia, crashed near Brussels, Belgium. There were no survivors. It was a devastating loss for all of figure skating, not just U.S., but they canceled the world championships that year. You know, it took a long time for skating to kind of get back together because we lost all of our top coaches in the country. My coach was killed on that plane. He was coaching me out in California, and we had to regroup. and. You know, it, uh, it took a while. But in due time, U.S. figure skating would re-emerge, and it would re-emerge spectacularly thanks to the elegance, the finesse, and the beauty of Peggy Fleming. Peggy Fleming was very athletic and very tough. I mean, she was as tough as Joe Frazier. She just had such a balletic grace about her. It was a style she'd hone under the tutelage of a new coach, named Carlo Fossi. In 1965, I was invited to uh, come and train with Carlo Fossi at the Broadmoor in Colorado Springs, and that was a pivotal uh, move for me in my career. I just started to improve dramatically, training in the altitude, training with Carlo Fossi. He was a man of detail, 
And I grew up in a household, my dad was a, an ex-Marine. So us girls were raised like mer the Marine Corps. So everything had to be done perfectly or you're gonna do it all over again. So Carla was very much like that. Under Fosse, Peggy would win multiple national and world championships. And when it came time for the 1968 Winter Olympics in Grenoble, France, it appeared as though nothing could stand in her way of winning the gold. Nothing except maybe the weight of a heavy pressure she, at 19 years old, had never known before. Peggy Fleming skates better than anyone else in the world, better than any other girl. Something happens when a pretty girl is better than average on the ice. She is suddenly placed into a pressure cooker of training that puts her under the strain of a John Glenn or of a Kelso. I felt all the pressure. I felt the pressure of the U.S. You know, counting on me. I felt the pressure from the Skating Association. I felt the pressure of you know the media and and the pressure on myself. I wanted to do my best performance at the Olympics. Of course, that that would be the most ideal time to do it. Is all the hard work that you put in really worth it? Oh, I think so. You know, when you can come to an Olympics like this and represent the United States, it's really great. I was the person to beat. Everyone I knew was trying to beat me. But none of them would come close. I was doing school figures that that was 60% of the score back then, and 40% was the uh, free skating. I was 89 points ahead of Gabby Seifert going into the free skate. For Peggy, there'd be no looking back. Despite a free skate that was less than perfect, already so far ahead, she won the gold medal handedly. When they put the medal around your neck, then you feel like, oh my gosh, it, it, I really did this. And I remember touching it, thinking, oh God, it's really around my neck. But the most rewarding moment after I won was getting off of the ice and seeing the look um, on the face of my mom and my coach. They were so happy and so proud of me. I'll never forget that. It would be the only gold medal the United States would win during those 1968 Winter Olympics in Grenoble. For her to be the only gold medal that America won in Grenoble at those Winter Olympics, I mean, it was, you know, it was a time everybody was talking Jean-Claude Keeley. People weren't talking American women figure skaters. But all of that was about to change. That was a time where we needed a new beginning and we needed, you know, something um, hopeful. And I think my win at that moment in 68, there was so much going on in the world and in the States that, you know, a girl, kind of girl next door, went in and, and won this Olympic title. The significance wasn't lost on the country. Peggy Fleming was welcomed home as a hero. She was America's darling, the ice princess, whose quiet charm and unpretentious glamour would shepherd the sport of figure skating into a new era. Peggy showed you could be nice and you could be tough. Skating you know, really helped, helped me find myself and, and it kept pushing me through my whole career and gave me a, a life that I could have never dreamed of. When we come back, we wrap up the year where politics informed sports, the year records were broken and greatness attained. The Game Changer continues. It's said often enough that sports are an escape. But in 1968, they weren't so much an escape as they were a reflection of those chaotic times. There was the rise of athlete activism, the extension of sports into something much more than an arena of competition, becoming a platform for political change. That'll do it for us today. I'm Carrie Sayers. As we leave, one last look at 1968's remarkable year in sports. <laughs>